Good Hi time. everyone. Um, I'm going to start off because I spent a long time persuading my kids that they had to understand who someone was so they could understand what that person had said. Um, and Global Graphics is a name that isn't all that well um, known. If you're in our area, you've probably heard of Harlequin, Harlequin Rips. Um, so Har Com Global Graphics is the company behind Harlequin. Um, I'm also going to start with an apology because I was having the same crashing issues with PowerPoint that Carsten did. Um, so I'm running in, in PDF and if I look a little confused it's because I rely on that presenter's view to tell me what's coming next. I can't remember. But before I dive in to this discussion I want to really understand who I've got in the audience here. So if you guys use PDF in the context of any kind of printing Put your hand up. Oh, that's a good start. Okay, so if you use PDF in any kind of high volume printing, as in not just um, printing from a desktop to a to a local device, put your hands up again. Okay, I've still got half of you. And how many of you guys are in transactional print? So statements, invoices. Um, insurance quotes, the really high volume, relatively simple documents. Hey, getting a smaller number. And, and how many of you are doing uh, more graphically rich things like direct mail and that kind of stuff? Oh, an equal number of you. Welcome. I was kind of expecting this to be more transactional given the co connections into PDFA and the history of the PDF Association. So great to see you. Okay, I'm here to talk about PDFBT. I gave a brief intro this morning to, to, to what's happening, um, what the future is for, for BT, and now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the format itself, the whys, the wherefores, and the why it's not quite enough. And of course, being PDF, I've lost my builds, which is, yeah, well, I'll have to talk around that. So, um, start off with a with who uses PDF for variable data and direct mail, and I apologise, this one's a bit of an eye chart. But if you look up the left-hand side, you've got a variety of uh, different file formats used for variable data print from <coughs> gen layout, AFP, PPML, optimized PostScript, etc. And the, the long red bar along the bottom is PDF. So this was a survey that InfoTrends did in, ooh, I can't read that, 2010, asking print service providers what formats they used. Now, print service providers as a group, we'll tend to bias this towards the graphic arts formats and away from AFP. You'll see AFP is a pretty short bar, but that's partly a result of the, the target audience for this. But you'll see you've got nearly 60% of those print service providers using PDF, and far more than the next one down, which is PPML. And I think you've also got some indications that people didn't know what we're talking about because you've got people claiming PPML, BDX, and far larger proportion than I would have expected. So back in 2010, there were nearly 60% of print service providers saying they were using PDF for variable data print. <coughs> in 2011, they did a similar survey, slightly different aim, looking at um, what different DFEs, digital front ends on, on production presses, um, were like, what their capabilities are, what people were actually using them for, and it was up to 85%. So I think you can very clearly make the claim that PDF is the dominant um, data delivery format for variable data print. You'll also notice I'm talking about PDF VT and if you can squint hard enough and see the, the names down the left hand side there is no PDF VT on this list. This is because the survey was done in two, or surveys were done in 2010-2011 PDF VT was only published in 2010. The first implementations against the draft standard were shown at IPEX in, in 2010 but there wasn't really any, any adoption that early. It's come since then. So, okay, if everyone's using PDF, let's get the background in place. Why use PDF? Why are they doing that? What are their advantages? Well, it's supported on many digital production presses. If you need to move a job between presses, and, and most print service providers now have a mixture of presses, press types from different vendors, you can typically move a PDF file between them fairly easily. One breaks down, you suddenly find you can't get the media you want on one press, whatever. At the same time, every composition tool 
And in the variable data print space, composition is the, is the term that's used for the tools that create the PDF file or, or the data stream that's going to the press in the first place. Virtually every composition tool creates PDF. So you can mix and match your composition tools and your output engines. And this also leads to the ability to, uh, to deliver almost a blind exchange from uh, composition in one company to a, to a print service provider. It's capable of graphically rich designs, and this is really the killer for PDF. This is why PDF has taken off in this space. Um, not the only reason, but one of the key reasons why PDF has taken off in this space, because the marketing officers, the CMOs, the, the, the brand owners, want to see the same graphically rich designs on their variable data direct marketing pieces, on the, the, um, the headlines in a, on a transactional piece, as they're using in their magazine advertising, their TV advertising, um, product boxes if it's a product company, etc. And if you can use the same format in both places, then the, you can use the designers who understand that format. Um, and you can get much more commonality, much more richness into those uh, variable data print, print uh, streams. Universal access to viewers, anyone and everyone in the organization can open the file and say, yes, this is good, or hang on, we have a problem. When you're sending that design off to the lawyers to say, did I catch all the registered trademarks? Am I infringing anyone else's rights? They can open it up. You don't have to give them a special PPML tool or pre-render something for them so that they can sign it off. And even non-specialists can make reliable files. This comes back to the to the idea that the, the variable data print marketplace is opening up to the point where, although in many places what the print service provider gets is a database under design, and they put those two together and then print it, there is a more of a move towards um, the, the if, you, if you like, the print buyer, although that's an endangered breed, the designers at the brand owners creating the entire file and almost throwing it over the wall into the print service providers to print. Now, that would be dangerous with the other file formats. It's a little bit dangerous with raw baseline PDF, which is obviously where PDF VT is going to come in. Now, PDF VT <coughs> makes PDF better in a number of different ways. First of all, and I mentioned this this morning in the seven minutes if you were here. Um, it builds on PDF-VT. PDF-VT was the first PDF subset standard. In fact, work started on it, on it in, in CGATS before it moved to ISO. It started back in about 93. So we've been working towards this stuff for quite a while. And PDFX essentially reinforces <coughs> self-discipline. It requires all your fonts are embedded. It requires that your colors are characterized. You've heard this before in talking about PDFA. And for exactly the same reasons, you want to be able to reproduce a file in exactly the same way in multiple locations on multiple technologies. So this, that's why you need these things in place. And design, designers are usually pretty good at this stuff if they've been taught anything about print, which <coughs> unfortunately isn't as common as it used to be. Um, but the fact that you've got a label that is attached to a format that is designed to be good for print makes it easy for the design tools and the composition tools and the pre-flight tools to have an option that you just check a box and say, I want PDF VT, and they will make you a file that is halfway there to being good PDF for print. It checks that, you've, that it will embed all the fonts as you save the file. Pre-flight tools will automatically check that the fonts are there, that kind of stuff. So it, it reinforces self-discipline, and it makes it easier for the tools to help you in reinforcing self-discipline. The second thing in PDF-BT is that it supports a new structure. It's created as part of the first PDF-BT standard. Um, and as of PDF-2, it will be in the, the mainstream PDF standard as well, called Document Part Metadata, or DPM. You'll sometimes hear people say DPART instead. And that's a, a hierarchy of metadata about pages in the file. Now, the concept behind the, the um, DPM structure is to allow you to associate whatever data you want to do with a page, 
or a set of pages, or a set of set of, sets of pages, etc., up a hierarchy. Sometimes that's really useful in tracking where a job has gone. So if you're in the context of um, direct mail or some transactional workflows, being able to put the, um, the name of the recipient of each set of pages, because the file is probably recipient one's pages, re recipient two's pages, etc. Andy, John, Bob, whoever. Um, sometimes it's useful just to be able to put the name of the recipient together with that set of pages. Sometimes it's useful to be able to say, oh, and by the way, this set of recipients live at this, this zip code, postal code, how you, want to, how you phrase it in your country, etc., up the tree. It's, it was also intended to support job ticketing by tying data to a templated JDF file, job definition format from SIP4. JDF is quite widely used now in process control and workflow control for static print, for non-variable data printing. Um, the intention was that DPM would allow you to tie each recipient into an instance of a, of a job ticket and have that job ticket automatically instantiate over as many as you need for the number of recipients. That's been adopted by some people, um, but there are a number of people pushing back, which is why, as I mentioned this morning, um, the PDF VT Competence Center in the PDF Association is now working on a slightly different approach to that, still using DPM, still using metadata, but now adopting something closer to the uh, the SIP4 output intent model, which says I'm going to describe how these pages should look when they have been printed and finished, rather than describing how they should be processed to get to that result. The assumption being that the workflows have the intelligence to get from um, I need these pages printed duplex and these pages printed simplex to, to figure out how they have to do the process inside the, um, the workflow. So that one's ongoing. Um, third benefit of PDFVT is that it includes hints to, associate, to, to identify reused graphics. <coughs> um, as you know, many variable data files have some areas of a page, some elements on, on a page, images uh, and graphics, etc., which are used for every recipient of that job. If you think about a direct marketing postcard, um, you may have a background image that every recipient of that postcard gets. And there may be some variable data over the top that may be as simple as Dear John and an address. Or it may be much more complicated. Um, and of course there is also cases where you're constructing a postcard um, using metadata that someone upstream knows about you to identify the images that are going to go on the postcard that you're going to receive. The classic example is um, a car dealership saying, you know, buy a new car, sending out a <coughs> postcard that happens to have an image of the latest version of the model of car that you bought from them two years ago. So if you bought a saloon, it's a picture of a saloon, in the same color that you bought it in. If you bought um, an estate car, a station wagon, there's a picture of a station wagon in the same color that you bought it in, but the latest model just to try and connect with you, and often details about the dealership that's nearest to you so that you, you've got all of that detail. But those graphics are also reused. They're just not reused for every person who receives that postcard. And finally, and I mentioned this this morning, support for streaming. If you're running really long jobs, and this is primarily in the transactional space, um, it used to be the case people would buy a, a, um, a Xerox black and white press and run it for three months on a single job. Now you obviously can't create the whole print stream up front and then turn on the printer and, and pour it into the front end. So the composition engine would start creating the job and a few minutes later, typically, the press would start churning out paper. And three months later, the end of the job would come through the composition engine. You can't strictly do that with PDF, but PDF VT, especially VT2, supports a model that allows you to do something that looks almost indistinguishable from that. So, all of these things make PDF VT good. It's better than 
any of the um, alternative formats that you can pick in terms of how many presses you can drive, how many composition engines can produce that, how many people in your organization can view the files and sign them off, um, the richness of the graphics it can carry. VT adds over the top of baseline PDF with these things. But it's still not a magic bullet. So let me take you on a little tour of a print service provider. <coughs> you bought a new press, it's installed. Your production staff are trained and the prints coming off look great. You've got the finishing all configured, so you've got all the, the, the trimming, folding if you need it, envelopes, insertion if you need it, all set up and, and, and it's looking good. The work flies are coming together so you understand how things work as they flow through. You, you know to predict from what's happening here, what's going to happen here. You've even made the great leap of teaching your sales staff how to sell digital print. That's probably the biggest job on the list here. You're tuning your job scheduling and your pricing so you can actually make money on this because you can work out what the real capacity of your company is to get stuff through that press. So you're hitting deadlines. Customers are happy. The first one's online. You're just about to open the floodgates for the next bunch. It's almost as if the jobs running through that press really are the, the beating heart, the lifeblood of your company. And then you get a heart attack job. And, uh, you know, I was looking at Frank's presentation this morning and looking at his job from hell, really complicated job up there, and thinking, I wish any of my jobs were as simple as that. But you get one that looks like that. And then, I don't know if any of you were in Bruno's session this morning at looking at uh, decoding jobs that go wrong. Suddenly, that job that you thought was going to be really easy isn't. Now, sometimes it's, it just doesn't run at all. It falls flat on its face, or you get blank pages, or the output's wrong. There's a lot of things you need to do in that situation, but I'm not talking about those. What I'm talking about is that job, like the simple one up on the screen, that you thought was going to run through your system like this, and suddenly it's going more like this. And everything slows down. Deadlines are coming close. You don't really know what's going to happen through the rest of today. It's, it's, it really is like a cholesterol clump crumb for your press. And it's not that uncommon. These are some quotes from uh, just, just some friends I was validating some of the ideas we were uh, talking about in, in Global Graphics and trying to get some input. So John Charnock, I don't know if any of you know, know him from St. Ives in London. He said, I've experienced many challenges when receiving badly produced PDFs for variable data documents. The difference can be from days of additional processing to not processing them at all. That's pretty, pretty much of a stopper for anyone trying to run a print service provider. Um, Andy Sarianas, also from, from London, a small digital production company this time. Even the slightest glitch can result in a tremendous amount of waste or lost time. And then from a little American company you may have heard of, uh, R.R. Donnelly, uh, the biggest print company in the world if you're not in print. Um, un unpredictable delays can wreak havoc with low margin, high volume jobs often found in business transactional applications. And you know, I didn't have to go looking very far for these. I said, is this a good idea? Do I, do I need to be talking about this subject? And they said, oh yes, and sent these quotes to me. So you're not alone. And it doesn't actually take that much. If you think about a sheep-fed digital press, and this example happens to be HP Indigo, because that runs at 120 pages a minute, which makes the math really simple. Um, if you're running at 120 pages per minute, then every page, you need to prepare every page for print in half a second. And this matters in variable data print far more than it does in static print. If you're doing print on demand, if you're printing 50 copies of every job that runs into the press, then you don't have to worry that much because you've got 50 times half a second to prepare each page. If you're printing variable data print, the general rule is that you have to assume that every page will be different and therefore has to be processed and delivered separately. Now, yes, if the back of every postcard is the same as every other postcard in that series, 
half the time you half, half of those pages you can you can prepare once, but the fronts you have to do separately. So the digital front end and the reps in the digital front end, which is obviously why I care, have to actually process that job to send it out to the press in half a second per page. All the colour management, all the rendering, all the font handling, all of that stuff. So if it takes an extra half a second per page on a 10,000 page job, which isn't a particularly big one, it, it's reasonably typical for that class of device, you've added 30 minutes to, to the run. It takes twice as long as it would have done otherwise. You go to the top end of the state of the scale, and again, this is a press I'm intimately familiar with. That's something like the um, HP T410, running at 600 feet per minute and 42 inches wide. That thing has a duty cycle of something like 120 million pages a month. Um, so the DFE has 11.5 milliseconds to deliver each page you're pouring something of the order of 20 gigabytes of raster data per second out of the DFE. 20 gigabytes per second. I have to repeat that because when I sit in the audience for this kind of thing and someone throws a big number at me, I think, oh, that's impressive, and I don't actually think about it. And then I sit down and think, okay, so that's going to fill up the disk in my laptop in, I don't know, 20 seconds. <laughs> it's, a lot of, it's a lot of data. And if it happens to take a tenth of a second extra per page because it's a really complicated job, then a million page job, and yes, that million page job is a pretty big one even on one of those presses, although um, I know we have customers running eight million page single jobs. A mi one, point, one tenth of a second per page on a million page job is going to add 24 hours to the run. You don't really want that happening. Because if every page takes longer, if every job takes longer, you don't print as many jobs in a shift, your return on investment, your revenue goes down. You can't pay for the press. You may miss the deadline for that job, which tends to annoy the customer, first off. If you're in transactional space, there may be a regulatory framework around that. that says you've got to get these credit card statements out within three days or whatever it is. Even if it's not in a regulated situation, there may be some um, contractual penalties on there. You're printing a marketing piece that has to go out just before a trade show and you don't get it out on time. There is no value to that piece anymore. If one job's running late, you haven't got an infinite number of presses. You've got to put your later job somewhere. Are they, are they going to just hang around and wait for this press? Can you move them to other presses? Have you got the media you need on other presses? And you probably at this point need a few more slightly more expensive staff to deal with the situation, both talking to the customer and trying to sort it internally. So obviously, it would be great if you could avoid the heart of that job. We started looking around and found there are lots of guides on how you design direct mail print jobs and transactional print jobs as well to, to get more eye time, as some people call them, more time when the user is, or the, the, the recipient is actually looking at them. If it's a direct mail piece, um, you have to get the, 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 the reader's buy-in within something like half a second or it's gone straight in the bin. You pick it up from the, from the letterbox, you look at it, it's gone, or it's a, yeah, I'll look at that later. And there's lots of pieces, uh, lots of work around how you make readers look at your stuff more. Um, Pogi started off, Digital Print Council did some stuff, um, Frank Romano was quite involved in that second one. But even a decade later, there's nothing that helps people actually create the files in a way that's, that will go through a print service provider without causing problems. Until, da -da, until now. Um, so the line at the bottom here is what pays my airfare to get here. Um, we've just produced a guide called uh, Do PDF VT Write, and I meant to carry one through. They've got some copies on the, uh, on the front desk. Um, which essentially helps you make a PDF file in a way that will run through print service provider efficiently. Now, by the way, a lot of stuff in that 
is also relevant to PDF delivery online because it'll help you make smaller files, um, which obviously take less space. If you're generating them um, on the fly, you can deliver them faster, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, now I'm going to brush over this because it's all commercial, except I'm going to point out that two of the sponsors for this are Explore International and Podi, um, who at least in the United States, are really quite influential in the digital print marketplace. Explore at the transactional end and Podi in the, uh, in the more graphic arts area. They are international organizations in the way that many American organizations are international. Mm, say no more. Um, so it provides a backgrounder to understand why speed matters. I've talked about some of that today. Uh, it, provides a, a slightly more detailed background on PDF-VT than I've had time to provide today. And then it includes a number of actionable recommendations on how you can make a PDF file that will run more smoothly through a production workflow. I get asked, who's it for? Because surely that's only relevant to some really small proportion of people. And my response is, well, yes. The bulk of it, all the recommendations, are, are really important for the people who, for the operators on composition tools and for the designers who are creating variable data pieces in the first place. But somebody's got to tell them it exists. Someone has got to tell them it's okay for them to spend some of their working hours thinking about it and figuring out how to improve processes in their company. So it's actually quite important for brand owners marketing officers, production managers, print service provider managers, to understand this stuff, at least at the high level. So what we've tried to do is structure the guide. So the first few sections are appropriate for, for those people to understand that there, that there is a problem, that there is a solution to it, and that they can pass on some detailed recommendations to their staff. And then, as I said, most of the remainders are applicable to graphic designers, composition operators. Um, there is actually a section right at the end because we found we'd got a, a bucket of stuff that was probably too technical for designers and, and, um, and composition operators and that they couldn't, probably couldn't influence anyway. And that's actually tucked in there for the composition software vendors themselves so that they can think about what they can do to improve matters in their software. And this is what I'm losing with the builds in my um, PDF file. The bottom line is, don't make DFE swallow an elephant if it only needs to swallow a mouse. And if I'd got my builds, I'd have a little mouse here. Ah, well, there's PowerPoint for you. And what that means is, don't make the DFE work <coughs> harder than it needs to do to achieve the design that you really want to print. It doesn't mean compromise on what you want to print. If you've got this amazingly wonderful complicated graphic and that's what the, the marketing officer has signed off as saying this is what I want on my direct mail postcard or in the white space on a transactional document, then you know what, that's what you're going to produce. And I'm not here to say that's the wrong thing to do. What I am here to say is that there are quite a lot of ways in which you can produce two identical results on the printed paper, one of which might take 10, 50, or 100 times as much processing power in the DFE as the other one. And if you're in that situation and you follow a few simple rules, you ought to end up with the quick one, the one that doesn't get in the way, that doesn't blow your deadlines. So the recommendations are in six sections. First one being use PDF VT if you can. Now, it may well be that your print service providers aren't ready to take it if you're, a, if you're um, buying this kind of uh, work. Um, a, a PDF VT file, by the way, is just a PDFX file also, which is just a PDF file. So even if your print service provider says, I can't take PDF VT, that doesn't mean you can't give them PDF VT file because at least VT1, um, because if they can take PDFX, they'll get the right result. There's some stuff about image usage, about live transparency, about vector graphics, about how you lay things out on the page using variable data um, composition tools. And as, as I said, some issues for 
software vendors. Just a couple of examples. These are the, these are the two that we see most often. In fact, uh, our customers don't even bother to tell us about these anymore because they, they've learned to recognize it themselves. We very often see images that are stupidly high resolution in a file meant for print. And this is just an example. We've seen 24 megapixel photographic image placed at this size on a page, one inch across. That means it's 4,000 pixels per inch effective resolution. Now, depending on your press, um, the maximum resolution you can probably get any benefit from is probably around 300 pixels per inch. Uh, obviously, ask your press vendor if you're in that position what they recommend, but typically going over about three, 300 is a waste of space and resources. So in that example, you're sending 175 times as much image data as you need. And all that image data needs to be decompressed, color managed. Um, if it's rotated, that's a big job. If it's associated with any live transparency, that makes it a huge job. Um, and then screen and output, obviously. So there's quite a lot of work to do with, with images. In fact, we used to say before PDF live transparency came along, the only way of predicting how long a PDF file would take to rip would be look at the file size, because it's the images that make the big file size, and it's the images that take the time because there's a lot of work associated with processing them. Second example is transparency. A lot of designers don't realize they're using transparency because, well, I only put a drop shadow on something. Um, I've heard that many, many times. Um, if you're rendering PDF normally, and you've got one element on top of another, what you do is you replace all the colors of the first element with the colors of the second element as you render the second one on top. If that second element is not opaque, if there's any live transparency associated with it, what you have to do is read the color that's there already, transform it into another color space, take the color of the new object, transform that into another color space, blend them together using one of the blend modes, and then transform them back into the output color space. It's not very surprising, it takes a little longer. In fact, we normally estimate that, I mean, these things vary hugely, but we normally estimate that if you're using live transparency, then the rendering of those objects and everything else underneath it will take 10 times as long as it would have done otherwise. But still, we see lots of people using drop shadows, which use live transparency on a white background or a black background. Neither of those is particularly useful. If it's on a black background, you can't see the drop shadow. Now, OK, if you're using rich black, so you've got a little bit of cyan or whatever mixed in there to get more punch, more weight in the black, in the drop shadow, and you haven't in the background, that's fine. If you can see it on the print, go ahead. If you can't see it on the print, don't do it. If you've got a drop shadow on white, then you don't need the transparency. You just need the, the um, smooth shading or whatever you've got in, up for the drop shadow itself. Both of them increase processing time quite a lot for no gain. So if you're a designer, don't do that. If you're a software vendor, think about how you can help designers to not do that. So I, I mentioned you know, Global Graphics is the company behind Harlequin. Um, I also mentioned I teach my kids to be cynical. Uh, not cynical. I get told off when I'm describing them as cynical. To understand where the person who is speaking is coming from so that you can figure out why they're saying it and what they're really saying. Um, so we've been selling rips to drive digital production presses for a number of years. Um, the second line, we get great feedback from the field, is the euphemism that my marketing department would sign off on. Uh, what that means is when our customers don't like the result, speed, output, whatever, um, they're pretty quick to tell us. <laughs> and usually it's not our fault. And we try and work with composition vendors. We try and go back to them and say, <clears throat> look, you could have done this a bit better. And sometimes they'll say, well, actually, a bit like Bruno said this morning on, on iText, um, it's not us, it's the way our customers have used it. It's the designer who put an, an asset together in such a way that when it flowed through the system, you get this, this result. Sometimes they'll say, oh, yeah, that's right. 
but it's great to work together on that, to, to build a, a community so we can all drive forward into the um, right areas. And we've been sharing a lot of the recommendations in the booklet with, with our customers for a number of years. We just felt it was about time to uh, put it out into the field. So where can I get a copy? It's a booklet. I've got one sitting on the desk in the front. Um, should have brought one through. Or if you want to download it from the web, there's the, uh, the URL there. And that was it. How am I doing on time? Good Not too bad. Enough for a few questions? Yeah. Yeah? Thank you very much. <laughs> questions for Martin? That either means... What's your Ooh. recommendation with drop shadow? Flatten it in the rip or flatten it up front? Never flatten up front. Okay. Never flatten up front. Um, it's based on the X4 anyway, so... Yeah. yeah. If, if you flatten up front, you either reduce the quality or you make the processing time even longer. Um, you, can't, you can't get a high quality, high quality and a better processing time like that. And, and you run the risk that if you start moving something from one machine to another, so you flattened it for the wrong thing, um, that you'll reduce the quality anyway. So never flatten up front. Questions? Either I covered everything or you've all gone to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Martin.